Today is the 15th Sunday after Pentecost, and for our worship today, we have kind of a dual theme. Both focus on the Christian in the world. In our first and gospel lesson, the focus is on our, the Christian's use of money in the world and how God gives us many gifts for our good and for our use. And our guest preacher will be preaching uh, on how our students, our college-age kids, uh, are living in the world. How do we have that balance between our faith and the world? Today we have with us Pastor Dan Lindner, who is, I think you're in charge of campus ministry for Wells, living in the Twin Cities area. He will be our preacher today. Our opening hymn is number 708, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Today's order for worship is the service setting one, beginning on page 154. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. 
I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you have told us not to be anxious about what we need for this life. Move our hearts to seek you and your kingdom, that all good things may be given to us as well. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated, and the eighth grade will sing their song, What is the World to Me?
The first reading is from the fifth chapter of Ecclesiastes. Anyone who loves money is never satisfied with money, and anyone who loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is vanishing vapor. When goods increase, so do those who eat them. What profit then does the owner get except to see these things with his eyes? The worker's sleep is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but a rich person's abundance possessions allow him no sleep. I have seen a sickening evil under the sun, wealth hoarded by its owner to his own harm, or wealth that is lost in a bad investment, or a man fathers his son, but he has nothing left in his hand to give him. As he came out from his mother's womb, so he will go again, naked as he came. From his hard work, he can pick up nothing he can carry away in his hand. This, too, is a sickening evil. Just as he came, so he will go. So what does he gain, he who works for the wind? Besides this, during all his days he eats in darkness with great frustration, sickness, and anger. So then, here is what I have seen to be good. It is beautiful to eat, to drink, and to look for good in all a person's hard work which he has done under the sun during the few days of his life that God has given him, for that is his reward. Likewise, for everyone to whom God has given wealth and riches, if God has also given him the ability to eat from it, to enjoy his reward, and to rejoice in the results of his hard work, this is a gift from God. For the man seldom reflects on the days of his life, since God keeps him busy with the joy in his heart. The word of the Lord. We continue with Psalm 128. This is a hymn version of a psalm, and the first four verses go to a refrain. The last verse goes to an amen. How blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find in God their great reward. They know a love for all their days. They gladly walk in godly ways. Blessed are
The second reading is from the second chapter of Colossians. This is the basis for today's sermon. Therefore, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in Him by being rooted and built up in Him and strengthened in the faith just as you were taught, while you overflow in faith with thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit which are in accord with human tradition, namely on the basic principles of the world, but not in accord with Christ. The word of the Lord. Please rise. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter. Jesus also said to his disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager who was accused of wasting his possessions. The rich man called him in and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you can no longer be manager. The manager said to himself, What will I do since my manager is taking away the management position from me? I am not strong enough to dig. I am ashamed to beg. I know what I will do so that when I am removed from my position as manager, people will receive me into their homes. He called each one of his master's debtors to him. He asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, Six hundred gallons of olive oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and write 300. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? And he said, 600 bushels of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 480. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. For the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the children of light are. I tell you, make friends for yourselves with unrighteous mammon, so when it runs out, they will welcome you into eternal dwellings. The person who is faithful with very little is also faithful with much, and the person who is unrighteous with very little is also unrighteous with much. So if you have not been faithful with unrighteous mammon, who will entrust you with what is really valuable? If you have not been faithful with what belongs to someone else, who will give you something to be your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. The hymn of the day is number 807. All depends on our possessing.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Before I read the sermon text to you, just want to give you a little brief overview, at least, of some of the work that I'm called to do as our Wells Campus Mission Counselor. For a young adult, as they turn 18 and they finish their high school years, there's generally a number of routes that they're able to go. Uh, one of those routes is they're going to enter into the working force. They're going to go right from high school uh, into the working force, and, and they may stick around where they live. And so one of the concerns that all of our congregations and our synod has is how will we best serve these young adults? So for that situation of where, if they're going to go the route of where they're going to continue where they're at and go into the working field, that's where the home congregation is there, and they continue to be a part of that church rather actively and, and under the care of that congregation. Another route that a young adult might go is they may say, we're going to go down the route of going into the military. And so our synod also has an area of service of where we try to stay connected or keep those individuals connected to Christ through, through the various individuals that are, are part of the military program that our, our synod has of pastors that are available to them to make visits on them, to send them emails, to encourage them to be available along with that home congregation. Then there's the other route, the third route. Those that are going to go to college or to an institution of higher learning. We have our own Wells Colleges of Martin Luther College and then also Wisconsin Lutheran College, the sister synod of ours in the ELS of Bethany Lutheran College. If they go to those places, there are pastors and teachers on staff who will continue to try to make sure those young adults are connected to Christ. But what about every other university? University of Wisconsin or the University of Minnesota or the Wisconsin system at places like La Crosse, Oshkosh, Whitewater. What about those students? Well, they still continue to be part of their home congregation, but because they're gone for about nine months out of the year, we want to make sure that they stay connected to Christ. And so what we provide as a synod are we have campus contact pastors, or in some instances, of where there's a full-fledged supported campus ministry. And that's the area of where I serve. I serve various congregations and locations of where we have Wells and ELS students who are away from home to make sure they stay connected to Christ. And it's with that we had a 100th anniversary of our Wells campus ministry that a section of scripture that was read to you earlier, I'll read it to you here today, that serves as our sermon text. It says this, Therefore, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him, by being rooted and built up in him and strengthened in the faith as you were taught, while you overflow in faith with thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, which are in accord with human tradition, namely the basic principles of this world, but not in accord with Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Little Johnny is set to go off to school, and his mom calls out to him and says, Johnny, make sure you make a good impression. A little later in life, little Johnny is not so little anymore, and he's off to his job interview of where he's hoping to be one of those individuals who wears the headset to take orders of people who are passing through the drive through at the fast food restaurant. And so mom and dad again encourage him and say, little Johnny, make sure you make a good first impression. Well, a little bit later in life, again, Johnny has kind of caught on the importance of first impressions, and there's a young lady that he asked to the high school dance. And she said yes to being his date, and so he had engraved in his head, he said, I got to make sure I make a, first, a good first impression. And so what does he do in those situations? He makes sure that he's dressed nicely. He makes sure that the speech that he uses is one that is respectful. He makes sure that he does all that he can not to offend those that he's around. Again, the saying that somebody came up with, you, only, you never get a second chance to make a first impression, is there inside of his head. And there's some truth to it, too, even though there can be some foolery that goes on with first impressions. Why is it that those first impressions seem to be 
where we put a lot of emphasis on how we look, how we talk, how we act, how we behave, what we say, what we don't say, well, it has to do with what the motivation behind those often are. The reason we emphasize making a good impression is because whether it's off to school and meeting the teacher for the first time or maybe the teacher meeting the students and their parents for the first time is because we want to have a relationship with those that we're meeting with. We want to be connected to them in some way. Whether it's in the form of a school relationship, the form of a work relationship, or the form of a dating or marriage relationship. A connection. Well, this morning we're not traveling to a first day of school or to a job interview, but where we're traveling is we're going to a congregation in Colossae, a place where the Apostle Paul wrote a heartfelt letter to this congregation, and he encouraged them to stay connected to Christ. And that's a theme that we have as the campus ministry committee of where we want to make sure young adults are connected to Christ on campus to make sure that not only those that we're connected to already make more connections so more can know about their Lord and Savior. And so we meditate on these words that are found in this letter to the Colossians. Apostle Paul, he opens it up, he writes this here, at least in the section that we have before us. Therefore, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him, by being rooted and built up in him, and strengthened in the faith, as you were taught, while you overflow in faith with thanksgiving. See, the Apostle Paul, he knew their situation. This was a congregation that he had this heartfelt letter of where he reached out to them because he knew that there was something going on in their midst that was trying to disconnect them from their Lord and Savior. And so as he wrote them, he, he encouraged them and he wanted them to remember where they had come from, where they had been and where the Lord had taken them through the relationship that he established. Again, that's something taking we're under the board for home missions, the campus ministry committee, and a couple things when we talk about church planning, that aspect of relationships, relationships, relationships is very important. And the relationship that the Apostle Paul wanted to remind this congregation of was the relationship that they had with the Lord. Continue to walk, continue to be rooted, built up, and just prior to this, he told them of where they had recently been. He writes this in chapter 1. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. You see, this congregation that had been founded there, this congregation that had been planted there, had followed the pattern and the ways of the world, and they were not connected to their Lord and Savior. Something not only that they were reminded of that they knew, but something the Apostle Paul also knew too. Again, if we go back in the history of where the Apostle Paul went as far as what we have shared with us on the pages of Scripture, think of the first time where we meet him. And imagine our first impression of this guy named Paul, formerly known as Saul. We run into him in Acts chapter 7 and 8. And what's going on, there's this gentleman by the name of Stephen, the guy for whom this congregation is named after. And he had just finished giving a speech to the leaders, the people that were there that were supposed to watch over the spiritual walk of God's people. And what had happened was they were so angered by his message, the fact that they had rejected Jesus, that they had put him to death, that they in turn put Stephen to death. And as you think about what's going on there, they also had someone in their midst, this young, educated man by the name of Saul, whom they were trying to impress, of where they would lay their cloaks down in front of him as he gave his approval. And they killed Stephen. And yet as we think about the words that Stephen said, one of his last, what, he, what we have recorded for us as being what he said, he called out to the Lord and he said, don't hold these sins against them. And this is where we know the answer that the Lord God gave to Stephen. 
He didn't hold them against him. As we have evidence with what happened with this man named Saul, who later, by the grace and mercy of our Lord God, was met on a road to Damascus. And there he went from being this great persecutor of the church to being a great missionary for the church. Why? Because the Lord God saw to it that he would connect to this man named Saul, who would later change his name to Paul. The Apostle Paul reminded the Colossian congregation of that too as he goes on and he writes to them after telling them about their relationship, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Where had they gone in their relationship with God? On the one side, they were alienated from God. Why? Because of what they were by nature and because of the evil behavior that they had. To the other side, of where he can so easily write to them and say, because of Jesus, because of a relationship established through him, that you are no longer alienated, but you are now found without blemish, and no one can make any accusation against you, because all your evil behaviors, all of your, your connections that you've had in this world and wanting to be part of this world have been forgiven through your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one with whom you are to continue to walk, be rooted, built up, strengthened, and overflowing. And now, my dear friends, that's the same situation we were, of where we were alienated from Christ, we are alienated from God because of our sinful nature and because of our sins that we commit. But yet, what happened with all of us? Who was it who saw to it that we were connected to Christ? That same gracious and merciful Lord God that saw to it that the Apostle Paul was called along that road to Damascus, saw to it that each and every one of us had a relationship established with our Lord and Savior. And how did that happen? For many of us, it was the parents that God gave us that brought us to a baptismal font just like that. And there, through the water and the Word, we were connected to Christ. Through family members, friends, or a call upon us by a pastor who saw to us the state of which we were in, and said, let me tell you about Jesus and what he's done for you by living for you, dying for you, and rising from the dead for you. And what happened? The Holy Spirit used that proclamation to see to it that we were connected to Christ. Relationships, 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 that's one part of this. The other part of it, again, another thing that our, our missionaries or our mission counselors would say when planting a church or, or looking to plant a church, not only are those relationships important, but also location, location, location. Again, for this congregation at Colossae, the Lord God saw to it that someone was there to be able to establish a relationship with them and preach to them the Word of God. That a relationship was there with the Apostle Paul of where he could write this heartfelt letter from the confines of being under house arrest. But he also has a warning for them. He goes on to write this in our text. He says this, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, which are in accord with human tradition, naming the basic principles of the world, but not in accord with Christ. Again, give you some simple illustrations of the, of the life of the child of God and the emphasis of wanting to make sure that they stay connected to their Lord and Savior. Right, this morning we, we heard some of those school children sing. We have seventh and eighth graders singing for us in both services this morning. And as there are crossroads that face an 18-year-old, there are also crossroads that face someone who's in eighth grade. Very often what can happen, and again, I got to glance downstairs and see all those many pictures of the confirmands throughout the years. And the devil is there as soon as they get confirmed, trying to tempt not only them, but also their parents to try to disconnect them from Christ. Through what? Through the warning that is here by the Apostle Paul. 
things that are hollow and empty, that are based upon the principles of this world and not in accord with Christ. So young men and young women that are here, set to get confirmed this year and those that are going to get confirmed the next year. Remember that confirmation is not graduation. It's just the beginning of another phase of life. For the parents that have brought them here, it's a beginning to another phase of life of where we want that continued walk, that continue to be rooted and built up in their Lord and their Savior to keep going. And then as they go through the high school years, that emphasis is there because a big, a big difference between the eighth grade to the ninth grade where going from age 18 to 19 is where when they go off, they're often left to their own devices. They don't have mom or dad or a little brother to get sent in or sister to say, ah, it's time to wake up and go to church. Continue to walk with your Lord and your Savior, Jesus Christ, being rooted and built up in Him. Because the things that are waiting, again, as the Apostle Paul warns here, are, hemp, are empty and hollow, are based upon the philosophies of this world, and not in accord with Christ. And what happens, it's not just at those ages, but also as we continue to age, as we look at our lives, we know the moments in our lives of where we've sinned and we've fallen away from our Lord because we've forgotten, or we've run away, or we've just deliberately rebelled against our Lord and Savior. Think of how in our lives of the special locations of being located in the Lord that we've needed, of where there have been moms and dads, pastors, God-fearing men and women who are part of a church, who have seen to it to remind us of the key locations of where we need to go and the location to where we're headed. Of going back and saying, yeah, it was there at Calvary, of where our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ died for all of our rebellions, died for all of our sins, of where we followed worldly philosophies based on mammon, as you heard about in the Gospel, based upon things in this world, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ took all of those sins away by dying for us and paying for them so that that relationship with our Lord God could be reestablished of what had been lost at the fall. The location of where just down from the cross, three days later, we go to a tomb and there what do we find? What do we hear about? That he's not there, he's risen from the dead assuring us of the resurrection that we have awaiting for all of us. Location, location, location of where young adults need to hear that reminder of who they are, what their Lord and Savior has done for them. Have that impressed upon them over and over and over again of their final destination is not here in this world, but with their Lord and Savior forevermore in heaven. Connecting Christ to campus is also connecting Christ to us. Again, and there's a, a story here that I'd like to share with you of serving young men and young women who are attending various universities. And again, more than that, I can tell you from, from living experience of how everyone here, this place, also left an impression upon me. But there's a story of a young lady of where I got to see that firsthand too of how there were God-fearing parents, a God-fearing school, a God-fearing Sunday school, a God-fearing congregation of men and women, some who went into the workforce, some who went into the military, some who went off to college, left an impression upon her. You see, she had gone to a university in the Twin Cities. It was one that was connected. To, it was a religious institution, and so the students there had to take some form of a theology class. And I believe, I, I'm going back, my memory's not serving me as well, but I'm pretty sure that she knew that she, she was trying to pick a class of where they couldn't screw a whole lot up with, with, with teaching the Bible because she knew the background wasn't from where she was coming from, and so she picked the Gospels. And little did she know, or to her surprise, she learned that they can really screw up teaching the Gospels. And one of the areas that her professor really messed that up 
was where he, he would say to them, well, here's a miracle again. This can't scientifically happen, so you don't have to really believe in this. Part of that institution, though, was the fact that when she first got there, they wanted to leave an impression upon her and her parents of saying, ah, you're here to think for yourself. You're here to develop yourself into adulthood, and by being a person of this institution, you're going to have that skill set. Emphasized in her class, too. But then what happened, she was pretty smart. She was used to getting straight A's, and she took a test. And on that test, I think it was something to do with the resurrection. Because again, that would be considered a miracle. She wrote down on her paper what she believed. She quoted the Apostle Paul, resurrection chapter from 1 Corinthians 15. And as she wrote that down, she got it marked off. Instead of getting 120 or 130 out of 125, she got 128 out of 125. Still an A+, plus, but it didn't quite sit real well with her at all. And so she took her paper that she had handed it back to her, her essay, and she said, why did you mark this wrong? You said in this classroom that I'm supposed to think for myself and I express my thoughts for myself right here. And the professor said, but you didn't say what I stated in class, and that's what I was looking for as an answer. And she again more fervently said, but you said, I'm supposed to think for myself. And the resurrection is so key because that tells us of the location where we're all going. And this wasn't the first time she challenged him, and he must have been having a bad day because his temperament wasn't real great. But he snapped at her, and his answer to her was this, not in my class, you don't think for yourself. Well, she, she protested that a little bit and showed him the syllabus, showed him the mission statement of the school, and again, got those points back. But why tell this story? It was the impression of a God-fearing home, a congregation that, again, had pastors and teachers, both in the elementary level and the Sunday school level, youth leaders, and then laity that wanted their young people to stay connected to Christ. That's a gift that God's given you here, too, leaving that impression for those that sang today, you have those God-fearing men and women, leaders that are here. Continue to walk with your Lord, being strengthened, built up, rooted when storms come. And then also being able to use what you learn in the hallways and in the sanctuary here to direct other people to their Lord and Savior so that they know, too, can know of that great relationship they have, that connection to Christ. So their final location is one with their Savior. Amen. Please rise. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll continue by confessing our faith uh, with the words of the Apostles' Creed as you have that printed for you on page 163. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Maybe see. The prayer of the church is in your worship folder. In our special prayers, we give thanks with Mike and Christine Erdman on the occasion of their 45th wedding anniversary. Lord, give us prosperity and goodness as gifts from your grace. We put our hope in you, O God. You richly provide us with everything. 
Keep our hearts and minds focused on you, the giver of all things, for you are good. Your mercy endures forever. We put our hope in you, O God. You richly provide us with everything. Teach us the value of worldly wealth and goods as gifts to serve our needs, to help our neighbors, and to spread your word abroad. We put our hope in you, O God. You richly provide us with everything. Fill our hearts with a love that imitates your love, that seeks to help those in need, the homeless, the unemployed, the lonely, and those in every hardship. We put our hope in you, O God. You richly provide us with everything. We praise and thank you for those who write and those who preach the gift of your gospel. Keep the good news of your forgiving love before your people that they may be renewed in your holy image through the righteousness of Christ. We put our hope in you, O God. You richly provide us with everything. We know there are problems that money can never solve, so we turn to you, gracious Father and giver of all. Strengthen faith, comfort and heal all who suffer pains of mind or body. Turn their thoughts from earthly struggles to the heavenly wealth of faith and hope, which is ours in Jesus Christ, our Lord. We put our hope in you, O God. You richly provide us with everything. Mighty Father, in Eden you brought Adam and Eve together in marriage and then pronounced your creation very good. We thank you for the many good blessings you have given to Mike and Chris Erdman in the 45 years of their marriage. Continue to provide for all their needs, sustain them through all troubles, let them continue to grow in their love for you and for each other. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. O Lord God Almighty, do not deprive us of your many gifts and talents, but give us wisdom to make a right use of them, that we may give a good account of our stewardship when the great judge will appear, the Lord Jesus Christ, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, blessed forever. Amen. It has been our custom in the last two years since COVID to receive our offerings at boxes near the doors. We give thanks to our God for the gifts that he, give, gifts that he gives to his church through his people. O oh Lord, stir up the wills of your faithful people, that those who have freely received blessings may freely give from your blessings. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We continue with the next hymn, number 819, If God Himself Be For Me.
Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 678, Once in the Blessed Baptismal Waters. You may be seated. First, we thank Pastor Dan Lindner for his message today. He will be talking more about campus ministry 
and have a PowerPoint presentation uh, down in the basement immediately following. Uh, also, uh, all the other announcements are on the news sheet in the bulletin. Uh, I want to highlight two of them. The first is that our mission festival will be on October 2nd. In a way, this will be the year of two mission festivals because uh, campus ministry is part of our home missions. Uh, but we will also have Pastor John Baer, who will be talking about world missions and Asia Lutheran Seminary uh, and his work or his upcoming work there. That will be on October 2nd. Also, uh, we are looking, still looking for a janitor for the school. Uh, if you know of anyone who might be interested, please encourage them to apply. And in the interim, we are looking for volunteers to come and do some light vacuuming, bathroom cleaning. If you are able to help with some of those more basic things, please let Gene Nimmer, our Board of Property and Maintenance uh, head, or let the church office know. That's all for this week. Enjoy the sunshine today.